thank you, Michelle, for introducing me, and everyone for coming. Um, the timing of this is a little weird. I think we all know, but it's so amazing to see you all here. Um, it just warms my heart. Um, you guys are Carlton for me, and let's just do it. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, like Michelle said, the title of my paper is Racial Conscience and Social, Social Revolution, Understanding the Enigma of Aimé Césaire. And so with the, the encouragement and guidance of Sharif and, and Dana, um, I came about this topic really circuitously, but I first was introduced to the poet and politician Aimé Césaire in a class that I had with Sharif last year. And I was really intrigued by how he addressed the question of black Francophone identity in a colonial context through poetry, which has really been the main, the main focus of my studies with the French department. Um, and so as I was thinking of comps topics, I started to dig a little further into Amy Césaire and his life, and I found out that he was a member, a prominent member of the French Communist Party in the 1940s and 50s. And that really struck me as strange, um, because he writes so much about what it means to be um, black and Martinican in the, in the colonial context, and that, that seemed kind of at odds with this universalist <coughs> communist um, so I started to research this more, um, and so my question really coming into council was like, how? Because these things seem like such unlikely analogs, being being a member of what is essentially like the French equivalent of the Harlem Renaissance, but also being a member of the French Communist Party. And so Césaire asks, and I sought to answer through this paper, how do you encourage the cu cultural awakening of Africa and its diaspora in the colonial context? As well as, how can art and politics work together for the liberation or independence of an entire people? And most specifically, can communism be used as a tool for understanding the black anti-colonial struggle? And so I use Césaire to try to understand these questions. So these are my primary sources. Um, my analysis is chronological, so I hope that will be kind of easy to take in. It's very sequential. And all of these, um, so I gave you the French on one side for the Frank Files view in here, and English on this side. Um, I'm gonna try to use Eng the English titles as much as I can, but I might slip up, <laughs> so try to be patient with me. The paper was in French, so it's like in my head in French. Um, and uh, all the translations that you'll see in this presentation are my own. So they're awful. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, so these are all Cesare's work, save for the first one, Legitimate Defense, which will serve as my theoretical framework. So let's be it. I thought I'd start with a map because Aimé Cesare is from Martinique, and it's a really teeny island. It's 45 miles long. Um, in, from like its longest edges, and so right here, um, in the Caribbean, in the French West Indies. And Amy Césaire was born in 1913, which is kind of like the height of the, the French colonial era. Um, and he was born just outside of the capital. His father was um, a small government official of some sort, so he did have some advantages <coughs> that maybe the average Martinique would not have. Um, and he was just a very bright student. So bright, in fact, that when he was in high school, he won a scholarship from the French government to go study at the Sorbonne in Paris in 1932, which is a pretty incredible place to be at that very particular moment. Um, in the Latin Quarter of the Sorbonne in the early 30s, there, was, there were just all these intellectual movements sort of exploding at once. So French communism, surrealism, <coughs> and what um, we will call, for the English purposes, the neo-Negro movement, all coming out of Paris at the same time and being the main influences on Césaire's work, which I will look into. And so <coughs> he 
um, was extremely influenced by this one journal that came out, which is called Legitimate Defense. And it comes out in 1932 and was written by um, several prominent Martinican thinkers at the time. So Césaire really looked to these people as like people he could be um, or could become, you know, after his studies. And um, so Legitime Defense has two, Legitimate Defense uh, <laughs> has um, like two main points. Um, and it, it's really addressed at like a liberal black readership in, in Paris. So Césaire, a young Césaire is like the ideal audience for them really at this time. Um, their first point is, uh, it's actually pretty radical, this is like probably my favorite, probably my favorite source because it's like a black francophone communist manifesto, pretty much talking about how the French Union, like the French colonial empire is a, is a capitalistic oppressor state and, and the black proletariat has to like overthrow it to liberate themselves and, and decolonize. Um, so. That's pretty exciting in 1932. Not a lot of people are talking about that yet. And the other main point was that up until this point, the <laughs> literature of the, of the French colonies um, is what, what one scholar, I, I like that he called it like a meager imitation of French literature. The goal was to sound as French as possible, to deal with French bourgeois, one would say, themes, and the goal was really that your readership could not tell your race just by reading. So the idea was to be as like français, français, very French as possible. And the authors of Legitimate Defense say that that's not right. Like, Why is there not a literature that expresses what it means to be African or what it means to be Caribbean and their real, their real experience and, and feelings of what it means to be black in 1932 instead of writing poems about like the palm trees of Martinique in Alexandrian you know prose which is what was happening up until that point um, but between these kind of two elements the the political and the literary these authors really pray, place more emphasis on the political so they say essentially that we have to become independent and then we can have things like a really individual art or literature. And Césaire does not agree with that, although he's really excited by these questions. And so Césaire and one of his um, friends and major influences, <coughs> Léopold Sédar Sarkozy, <coughs> who will go on to be the first president of independent Senegal, which is really cool, um, <laughs> found their own magazine. And it's called Étudiant Noir, The Black Student. And in 1935, Césaire writes this incredible piece um, called Racial Conscience and Social Revolution, which is pretty much a direct response to legitimate defense, in which he says that it is more important for the for colonized black Francophone peoples to create their own art and identity and know themselves before political processes of independence or decolonization can take place. So, I've only had a couple quotes, because he says it better than I could, but again, these are my translations. So he's responding directly to the authors of Legitimate Defense, and he says, act, they tell the Negro, but as to act is to create, and to create is to need and make rise one's natural substance. Our Negro cannot act, because he does not know himself and lives apart from himself, which I think is really, really powerful. So pretty much what Césaire is saying here is that, say we do have a political revolution for independence or for decolonization, then we would find ourselves, <coughs> maybe the Martinique, independent and free from France, <coughs> but who are we? We don't even know who we are as a people because we've spent so long under colonial rule having people tell us who we are and who we should be that we would not even know where to go from there, <laughs> pretty much. So he says before the revolution, one condition is essential. To break from the mechanized identification of race, to tear down the superficial value, and to season ourselves the immediate Negro, to plant our negritude like a tree and wait for it to bear its most authentic 
So um, here he uses his very famous word, um, nécritude, for the first time. And um, his literary movement, which kind of comes from his poetry, well, which I'll talk about later, that he starts, um, is called the nécritude movement. And Cesar is known as the father of nécritude. And what that means is pretty much um, understanding your identity as, as a black colonized person in this era and understanding it and, and using it to empower yourself and um, create something better from that. So <coughs> this most authentic fruit would be like the future of these people. So um, after that, <laughs> so that's a really, really, really great essay. Um, after that, um, Cesar finishes up his studies. He goes back to Martinique, he gets married and starts teaching at his, his high school, which he had loved. And he founds a new magazine in Martinique, which um, he wants to be a forum for contemporary like, political questions in Martinique, as well as art and poetry um, and opinion pieces. And it's called Tropics. And he founds it with his wife, Suzanne, and actually uh, also with his friend, Rene Menil, who was one of the founders of Legitimate Defense. And even though they did kind of fundamentally disagree with each other on parts of the communist question, which is, um, I kind of already talked about, uh, they were very good friends. And so they founded this, this new paper together. And in 1939, in, in Tropics, Césaire publishes um, this really long poem, which is called Notebook of a Return to My Native Land. Um, it's a really, really incredible poem. It makes him like an instant star in the Francophone literary world. And the, the style is really interesting. It's written in like a, sur a surrealist style, kind of stream of consciousness, strange, obscure imagery, which was pretty in vogue at the time. But something about it sets, sets it really apart. Cézanne just has like this incredible poetic voice. Um, and it speaks about what it means to be Martinique in 1939. Um, and what's incredible about it is that it responds, I think, perfectly to the call put out in, in legitimate defense to create a poetry or an art that is unique, that can really express the very, the very complicated identity of these people. And because it's so complicated, I think that poetry can be the best Form for this kind of thing because it's just so hard to articulate in any other way, but poetry serves it really well. Um, and so in the poem, Césaire talks about you know, what it means to be the descendant mm -hmm. of, of a slave and to live in this like very, under very harsh colonial rule, but instead of it just being negative, which is like a common discourse of critics of colonialism at the time, he says, he flips it on his head and says, that's what makes us powerful. And that's what should make us proud. And this is the root of what our identity will be when we are like liberated at last. So that's amazing. And he becomes, <laughs> he becomes very, very famous as a result of the publication of this poem. Um, so then I'm going to kind of skip over World War II and its implications for the French. <laughs> um, because Cesar's not writing quite so much during that time. Um, but uh, in the wake of World War II, um, the French Union is kind of like recollecting itself. Um, and Cesar is actually pulled in to, to help write, uh, write the new French constitution as a, as a representative from Martinique, from one of the colonies. Um, and He's very well connected because of, of his literature and his time in Paris. And so um, during the process of re rewriting the Constitution, he kind of remakes a bunch of political connections. And René Menil convinces him to run for um, the National Assembly, which is like the co Congress um, in France, uh, on the French Communist Party ticket. Um, and he, he wins. Um, and so now all of a sudden the poet who has been criticizing the politics is the politician. So the question is like, what is he gonna do now that he's actually in the system and not just outside looking at it? Um, 
it's it can be kind of tricky to understand him Cesar's joining the, the Communist Party because there's not too much written about like that specific decision from his point of view. But um, the party does put out this really interesting pamphlet in 1947 called Why I Am a Communist, and all these these famous um, or prominent party members write a little blurb about like, why I am in the, the French Communist Party. So we see Aimé Césaire has just this little paragraph, um, uh, which I just translate because it's short. So he says, I adhere to the Communist Party because in a world so little cured of racism, where the ferocious exploitation of colonial populations persists, the party has summoned the will to bring about the only social and political order that we can accept. And because it is founded upon the right to dignity for all men, regardless of origin, religion, and color. So I thought this was really fascinating because we can see how these two spheres of like the, the black anti-colonial struggle and the communist struggle are starting to overlap and align with each other. And that Césaire is saying, you know, for, for me and considering my goals at this time, the French Communist Party is the party that aligns most with issues that, that I have to deal with and that concern me, and like that the struggle of the proletariat can be equated in a lot of ways with the position of um, a black Francophone colonial subject. Um, so he is, uh, so Césaire's like main, main political legacy is um, the departmentalization of Martinique um, in 1948. And what that means is, so it's like becoming a state. They're, the département are like states in the US. Um, and so he succeeds in having the legal status of Martinique and a, and a few other colonies change from colony to department, which means that they go from being col um, colonial subjects to French citizens. But uh, this process doesn't work out quite so well as he wants to. Um, Césaire and the, and the Communist Party butt heads a lot with the, um, the like majority party in, in the French National Assembly at the time, which is the, the MRP, and departmentalization doesn't go so well. So, so Martinique becomes a department, but um, the Martinique don't really have like civil rights operating for them fully functionally. It's kind of analogous to like Jim Crow. Like on paper, they do have all these rights, but institutionally, nothing is really set up in their favor. And the French government pretty much ignores its obligation to develop Martinique and industrialize it. And, and there's an incredible amount of poverty and suffering. And for the everyday person there, things like don't really get that much better, and that makes Césaire really angry. Um, so he, and he blames this on the, the MRP <coughs> mostly, which is the majority party. Um, and so he kind of goes on like a talking circuit throughout France and also the Soviet Union, talking about how um, the French government is this terrible capitalistic oppressor and we need to like bring down the MRP. and. Um, in 1955, he writes this really uh, incredible short book called Discourse on Colonialism, which just like takes down the French government, like blow by blow, all the things that they have done wrong um, in the last like 20, 20 years or so. Um, and uh, it's, it's very much like a, a, a French communist manifesto of sorts, again, like reusing and recycling this Marxist vocabulary again and again. Um, but what's interesting and different here is that in Discourse on Colonialism, Césaire kind of takes it back out of, out of the context of Martinique and looks at the whole world and says that the world over colonization is doing this to people and it's not really particularly about like us as black people for him anymore in, in the rhetoric that he's using, but rather that um, colonized people the world over are all the same and all fighting for the same thing because they are a colonized proletariat. So the, the message kind of gets um, 
a little vaguer and it's less about like the particularities of Martinique or or the even the race politics of in, in some ways of colonialism but more about like the, the economic and capitalistic structures of it um, so this is kind of like the height of Césaire as like a really staunch staunch communism and then in 1956 sort of <coughs> everything changes um, the Khrushchev report comes out which reveals all of all of Stalin's crimes and all this time the French Communist Party and Césaire have been using Stalin and, and the Soviet Union as a model for what like, politics should be and how their, how their government should run because look how well it's working in the Soviet Union. And then everybody finds out that it like, was not working the way that they thought it was at all. Um, but what's really amazing is that Maurice Thorez, who is the chairman, the head of the French Communist Party, um, like doesn't make any comments about the Khrushchev reports, and he doesn't denounce Stalin, and, and the party says pretty much like, but in theory, Stalin was so great, and everything, like right after the Khrushchev reports come out, and Césaire is just like, what, are you sure? Um, and, um, but but in, in reality, is, is furious, is, is really, really upset, and says like, if you can't denounce Stalin for what he did to like his proletariat, you guys are, are so disconnected from what is really happening to people. Like you don't even understand what's happening for like the lowest of the proletariat. And so he writes um, Maurice Torres this amazing letter of like saying, like I am officially leaving the French Communist Party, and here's why. And it's long. <laughs> and it's, really good. Uh, uh, it's, it's it's really really interesting. So he he accuses the party of like elitism, um, hypocrisy, and then also takes him down for being assimilationist, um, for, for silencing his minority voice, for trying to publicly whitewash him and not talk about his race, and all these things that he hadn't really taken them to task for, but in this letter just like takes, uh, takes it down point by point. Um, so I have a couple quotes from it, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so he says towards the end, it has become apparent that our struggle, the struggle of the colonized against the colonial power, the struggle of people of color against racism, is more complex, and I would say is of a completely different nature than the struggle of the French worker against French capitalism. Our struggle cannot in any way be considered a part of that struggle. So what he had just written in Discourse on Colonialism about a year later, he, he pretty much says, you know, I take it back <laughs> because the racial question is important. Because you guys are in your in your equality, like paradise view of what government should run, like how government should run. You're not talking about race, but you don't understand that for people like me, that race is like it's the whole part. <laughs> um, so. So he, he pretty much says, I can't be involved with this party that I don't even feel represents me personally, um, much less like my constituents as a politician. Um, so, so ultimately he says, uh, it's neither Marxism nor communism that I renounce. It is how some have chosen to use them that I reproach. What I would like is for communism and Marxism to be used in the service of black people and not for black people to be used in the service of communism and Marxism, which I think already speaks for itself, um, and is really and it is really eloquent. But he he Cesare concludes in saying that um, that that communism <coughs> is, is not going to work in the in the fray. It's not going to be the right tool for the the black anti-colonial struggle because it essentially excludes them by by normalizing race along with all these other things, and that's really pragmatically not feasible. <laughs> so um, we can see that over the course of two decades, Césaire uses communism differently in different political contexts, and I, I just think it's fascinating how he uses communism as a rhetorical tool for what is, what is truly his his goal, which is 
to advance um, black Francophone uh, populations towards, towards political independence and, and creative freedom, and that he ultimately decides that communism is, is not really, really going to work. Um, so I really think that Césaire's work is, is pretty incredible. And, and I, I finished my analysis in 1946, or 1956, but I think that he is, a, among, among others who I did not have the time to talk about, is, is a spark for this wave of decolonization that happens in 1960 and this um, amazing movement of, of black cultural awakening that is to come um, as the black Francophone world does liberate itself. 1960, and uh, and I think that it really does does ring true ultimately that um, what he said that that the black world had to know itself well enough first to wage the revolution at last. Thank you. But I think that it was like the discussion that was happening in Paris through all of these um, these journals that were being published, which were used as like a dialogue for all these different political and, and artistic questions. So it was primarily in Paris, but it was cool. So like just as Césaire was from Martinique and and being educated in Paris, so was that the truth for for all of the colonies. So people from all over West Africa um, and North Africa were, were meeting in Paris <laughs> and talking to each other about these things. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering about how you break from the Communist Party. You mentioned that he wrote this letter to the Nazi Party and the Party and the assimilation and out of touch and yeah. activities reports to the USSR. Um, did, he, did he have those concerns before that he's given the occasion to, to do it, or was this sort of the building all along? Yeah, yeah, so I, I didn't quite have time to talk about that, but he he is butting heads with the, the Communist Party into the 50s because things aren't going well in Martinique. I mean, he does say, like, you guys, you know, are supposed to be helping me advance my constituents' like concerns in, in Congress, but they're really kind of silencing him and saying, like, we need to talk about worker strikes and and things going on in, in France. And he, and Cesar's like, well, there's, Ridiculous, uh, like really high unemployment rates in Martinique and things like that. And um, uh, what else was I going to say? And oh, also he was he was actually one of the first members of the National Assembly to really really seriously criticize how the French government was handling um, conflict in Algeria, like earlier than everyone else was, um, which is really interesting. And um, I think he felt quite often. That his, he was not 
being listened to or taken seriously because he was from um, an overseas department. So once once Martinique became a department, um, I think that his voice was just like very peripheral um, and and silenced often. So um, I know you studied abroad in Mali, and then you spent the summer in Haiti, and now you're doing a, a year comps on MACs there. So I'm just wondering personally, like, what interests you so much about colonial Africa and the Caribbean? about like, colonial history, I just had this really feel weird feeling that I was like, why don't I already know this? This is weird that I don't already know so much about this. And, and I very much just kind of feel that the things that I've, a lot of what I've chosen to study with the French department and also like political science um, is, is becoming more like mainstream history and things like colonial history, but it's just something that I was like, not exposed to when I was younger. And as soon as I started learning about it, I was like, there's just a whole flip side of history that no one is talking about. This is so, so, so bad. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then it felt, it felt really like different and everything that, I, that I've been reading and studying has just felt like so new, um, which was definitely hard going into this because I like, as soon as I started reading Cesar, like a bit in, I was like, I should find Martinique on a map. I just think it's been like exciting to learn about these things that I just did it like you know three years ago I wouldn't have known anything about any of the context of what I just talked about. Mm -hmm. Grace. Um, it's pretty clear from your talk and like I don't spend any time with you that you really like this topic. Um, and there were some times where you would tell me some fun facts and I don't think that I was listening. And so I'm wondering if there's anything that you came up with in your research that like was really inspiring or really exciting that maybe couldn't fit into this presentation. Into this talk. Um, so I originally approached Sherry Vendana with like and I four dissertation topics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, just a lifetime's work of a question, and um, I wanted to talk about like Creole identity politics and, yeah. and like everything that fell under that umbrella. Um, and so I did read a lot of books that I really, really loved, but just like they didn't fit into the presentation. So. I don't know if this is kind of going off of that, but like most of what was in my paper, I fit into my talk. But I did read um, other things about. I, was, I wanted to talk about Haiti too, but Haiti and Martinique are like apples and oranges. Like they're both fruit, but um, <laughs> 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 they're super different. Um, and uh, like there was just so much more. I wanted to read more novels and I wanted to talk more about how um, art fit into political discourse. I really want to talk about surrealism um, because uh, no book ever returned to my native land is is pretty surrealist poetry and like so hard to read. Um, very, very difficult to read. Um, but I, I am really um, interested in that. Yeah, I think that What's cool about the way that our French department does our whole curriculum is that you like learn to understand cultures by reading literature primarily. And so I ended up sticking with a lot of the political stuff because Cesar is a very straightforward, very clear political writer. Like discourse on colonialism, there's not a lot of subtlety. It's like very easy to understand. Um, but I, but I did kind of want to talk more about like art and narrative. But Um, I 
comments on the beginning, the new fact that Suzanne died in 2008. He lived so long. Yes. Yeah. He lived super, super long. He was the mayor of Puerto Falls until 2001. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I was going to ask, like, what, what did he do? What did he do? Yeah, so he leaves like national politics in, in 1956. When he leaves the party, he's like out of the National Assembly. Um, I think he, yeah, so he, he never is really involved with French national politics again, um, but he remains mayor of Fort de France until 2001. So he was mayor of Fort de France for. 56 years, um, and, and, and just extremely well-loved, um, very, very well-loved, and um, I think concentrated more, more on local politics and was more successful on a, on a local scale than he had felt on, in, in this larger context of like the entire French Empire Union. Um, so, uh, he keeps writing, and he, he writes more books. Um, he writes a couple plays that have become very famous, uh, which I would love love to read, but I haven't had the time yet. Um, and he does writing circuits, hangs out with Langston Hughes for a while, um, does more things with the surrealist community, um, but then keeps it pretty, pretty close to home. <coughs> But yeah, he's pretty prolific. Like he has many books that I did not talk about that come that come out. Yes, Pat. Uh, in your study of his writing, what do you feel that was his master stroke, especially in regards to the events of 1960? Um, I think that. Um, I think that racial conscience is, is his most amazing work. And I didn't even talk about this. It's it's kind of cool. It was like lost for a really, really long time. And people, um, so Tropics, the, the magazine that it was published in was like not super well known, was pretty local, like Beau de France, definitely didn't have the same leadership as the black student did in, in Paris. And it kind of got like buried in the archives for a really long time. And then later when he was using this word, Negritude again and again to describe his philosophy. There was actually this really interesting, like, scholarly um, debate over where was the first time that he used it, um, and that was contested until like, uh, I think in in like the mid '90s they found that essay again, and that essay was republished and and then became very well known, but it had been lost for like 40 years, 50 years, um, and it's very short and concise and. I think he, I tried to show that he comes full circle to like what he had thought when he was kind of young and maybe didn't even entirely understand what was going on and gets sort of bogged down in all these complicated politics. But in the end it was like, you know, when I went with my gut when I was like 26, I was right. Um, which is also kind of, um, gives us hope for the ideas that we have. <laughs> of Martinique because he really felt that they weren't ready to be independent um, because of the cultural question, but also because literally the island was just was not very developed and didn't have like great infrastructure in place. And he really felt that Martinique like needed France and needed to be part of France. Um, and Martinique is still part of France um, and never never really does gain its independence. Um, and that is, I definitely did not have, like, I wish that I had taken the time to look more into what the modern political situation is in Martinique. Like, I do know that it's still a department and they do still have um, some some issues with poverty, but I think that it's like, a, it's a tourism spot now. Um, and um, 
I don't know, I was in Haiti this summer, and I was doing a lot better than Haiti, but that's a weird point of reference. Um, but, it, but it is kind of interesting that he is like such an integral part of, of this just kind of series of movements of, of like the liberation of, of the black Francophone world that that Martin Hitch does not become independent. And I didn't really know like where that fit in like the pretty puzzle of my paper. So I kind of just left it down. Thank <laughs> you.